and now we're ready to look at negative selection. This is going to have a lot of parallels with what we did with B cells in that we are going to prevent our lymphocytes from leaving a primary lymphoid organ capable of recognizing antigen that belongs to you and not some foreign invader. Here we have the two cells that we're looking at. We're looking at those cartoons again. We have the TC cell that's involved in causing infected or malignant cells to undergo apoptosis. And we have the TH cell, which actually has a number of different versions that will help to tweak our response to some sort of foreign threat. How are we going to make sure these guys don't get out of the thymus? This is another way of saying that we're going to establish central tolerance as we did with the B cells. And we're going to make sure that they don't recognize self antigen. We can make an enormous number of different TCRs that are capable of basically recognizing almost anything. So there's a real danger here and we want to make sure that that danger is averted. The selection process that we're about to go through is going to remove two different kinds of things. Cells with a very high affinity for MHC all by themselves, and we'll get back to that in a minute, but you can see that if you can recognize MHC without even any antigen on it, then that's a real risk. And we're also, of course, going to get rid of cells with affinity for just the MHC and self-antigen, and those are the cells that really would be the kinds of cells that would level an attack directly at you. So here's the cell bringing back where we left off at the end of the last clip. We had made TC and TH cells. They have their own respectively CD8 and CD4, and they are therefore single positive, and we're ready to make sure that they go through this last round of quality control. And that means they have to move into the medulla of the thymus, which has the environment that will allow for the most complete thorough form of negative selection we can accomplish. We do that by promoting the medullary cells to lay out an antigen buffet for our new thymocytes. That is, they're laying out a huge variety of different self proteins as a way of trapping any TC or TA cell that can recognize one of those into apoptosis and elimination. So that the cells that survive all of this exit to the circulation and they're not only not going to attack things, they're not going to help upregulate B cells to attack things. So you can see that the thymus is making every effort possible to prevent that from happening. The way they do that is they get the medullary cells to express a variety of tissue specific genes. And in doing that, they're going to use two different transcription factors in order to promote the production of proteins that these cells ordinarily never would express and translate. The stromal cells in the medulla can transcribe and translate proteins normally only produced by differentiated tissues. And this is where we get that antigen buffet. The stromal cells do this by expressing two very unusual transcription factors which work together to allow for the expression of all of these genes that would normally be silent. The first one we're going to look at is the air transcription factor and this one is so unusual that some scientists have complained it's not a proper transcription factor at all. It seems to be actually something that targets chromatin more than it targets specific sequences on the DNA. It does in fact have some zinc fingers, uh, although for some strange reason they're more characteristic of plant versions. They have a nuclear localization site, so it's going to be dragged into the nucleus. It has some sort of sand domain, which is thought to bind to DNA, and it has an N-terminal similar to SP100, which is, seems to be a chromatin targeting region. This particular protein seems to specifically target histone H3 with the general function of loosening the attachment of DNA to histones in a relatively non-specific way. It also interacts with another protein, CREB, and this is a general upregulator of transcriptions, which kind of makes it sound like it's loosening up the DNA and then calling in some troops to come and do the actual promotion of transcription. When I looked at this protein, all I could think of is, my goodness, what a multi-crazy purpose protein this is. This reminds me of 
a Swiss Army knife. It seems to have all kinds of subparts that are designed to attract, attach, open up all different parts of the genome. So it's randomly upregulating transcription in thymic, epithelial, and dendritic cells. And mutations in this are inherited as a classical Mendelian autosomal recessive. In other words, if you can't make this protein by one copy or another, then you will get a really bad autoimmune disease. The name of this disease is APECED, but basically this gene is necessary to prevent autoimmunity. And in fact, the name AIR refers to the fact that it's autoimmune regulating. And when you don't have it, then you get autoimmunity. Our second transcription factor upregulates an entirely different variety of tissue-specific genes. So we're really gonna need both of these guys. This is the FESF2 transcription factor. That is an abbreviation for Four Brain Express Zinc Finger Protein 2. So this does have zinc fingers on it, which does suggest it binds to the DNA. And in this case, it seems to bind fairly directly. What it does, however, is it seems to bind fairly directly to the promoter regions of more than 10,000 genes. So in this case, you're not generally unleashing chromatin. You're directly promoting the expression of more than 10,000 tissue-specific genes. And again, if we have a non-functioning mutation for this in homozygous condition, we're going to get a really bad case of autoimmunity. But if you look at the autoimmune disease produced by that genetic defect, it actually works very differently from the one that was produced by the air mutation. So it turns out we're going to need both of these transcription factors in order to upregulate the production of all the different proteins we need in order to protect ourselves from self-recognition in thymocytes before they leave the thymus. So in addition to this, I want to get back to what I started with. We not only have to get rid of cells that recognize self-antigens, we also have to get rid of cells that bind too tightly to MHCs just on their own, and that's going to lead us to the Goldilocks principle a principle of just exactly how tight should your TCR bind to your MHC. Here we have a, a, a picture showing a, t basically the same receptors, just part of them, binding to MHC molecules, and these are shown with the little antigens. But supposing you have a receptor that binds to either MHC1 or MHC2 so strongly that it doesn't matter whether or not there is an antigen in there. Well, if that thing gets loose in your body, heaven only knows what it will do. It could upregulate all kinds of random attacks on things that were simply displaying an MHC molecule. So the first things that get deleted in negative selection are those receptors that bind to MHC all by itself too tightly. Then they also get rid of those cells that have receptors that bind to MHC plus this antigen while it's still in the thymus. Why is that? Because those are the cells that are recognizing self-antigen and could lead to autoimmune problems. And the bottom line is you're getting rid of anything that's binding too tightly and you're going to let loose things that are only binding a little bit. Recall, when we went through positive selection, the only thing that got through positive selection was something that could at least bind, kind of, sort of, or even more, to an MHC molecule. Now, when we get rid of these cells that have something that binds to the MHC molecule too tightly, we are getting rid of those things that could cause trouble. And down at the end of this, we're into something I refer to as the Goldilocks principle. You want something that leaves your thymus binding neither too tightly nor too strongly. Because what you want then is a T cell that leaves the thymus with an ability to bind to MHC2, but it can only bind to MHC2 if it also has 
a bit of antigen on it that that TH cell is specifically designed to recognize. And that's what you want. So you're looking for something that has a specificity for MHC2 and an ability to bind only those things it hasn't previously encountered in the thymus. What actually helps with this is here, look, look closely that at loops one and two, okay? So I'm gonna point out loops one and two on the beta subunit and one and two on the alpha subunit of the other one. And these are actually the loops that bind the MHC. And so these loops do have, although they're highly variable, a bias for picking up one or the other of the MHCs. Now, if they hit it too strongly, you're out of luck. On the other hand, we have the third loop, okay? So here's the third loop of the beta subunit, which has the high variability. And here's the third loop of the alpha subunit, which also has variability. And these are the ones that are going to be in contact with the antigen. So what you want is something that has loops one and two recognizing the MHC and loops three on both of them recognizing an antigen that they can't have seen before, which by definition makes it foreign. So when you look at the receptors of the TH cells and TC cells that leave the thymus, you will find that they have sort of a medium avidity or affinity for MHC. That is, they have just enough affinity to have proved to cells in the thymus that they can recognize MHC, but not so much that they seem to be about to endanger the body with an autoimmune response. All the other ones undergo apoptosis, and that's 98% of the cells. And of that 98%, more of them flunk the positive test than flunk the negative, but only a medium binding strength permits survival. And you can see that this is a tricky enough set of criteria that lots of cells die, and in fact, 98% of them do not make it through this.